The story of English began thousands upon thousands of years ago, when its earliest known ancestor language was spoken during the Neo and Chalcolithic periods, from the 5th to the 3rd millennium BC. We know it is Proto-Indo-European, PIE for short, and it will slowly transform into the language I'm speaking right now. Of course, this inheritance is not exclusive to English. As the name suggests, many of the languages of Europe and India branched off from this first known seedling. It's also important to stress that this is the first known Indo-European language, because Proto-Indo-European is not truly the oldest ancestor of English. It most certainly had its own ancestor, which in turn had its own ancestor, going back and back and back into the furthest recesses of time, which are sadly beyond our reach. We can go no further than Proto-Indo-European because it is a reconstructed language. We have no written record of it, and uncovered it by comparing ancient languages like Latin, Greek and Sanskrit. We can work back to reconstruct ancestor words, but once these strands have met to form a PIE word, we have nothing else to compare it to. We know of no sister languages with which to compare PIE, despite the futile efforts of some to prove otherwise. With this in mind, our journey to English begins here. So what was Proto-Indo-European like? Here's an extract from a short fable written in Proto-Indo-European. Tor rex heist soch nepotlos heist soch rex sunum velat. At first glance, it seems nothing like English, and indeed, the languages are not much alike. Thousands of years of evolution have seen to that. The most obvious difference revolves around morphological complexity. That is, how much individual words inflect to convey grammatical information. Start with nouns. A standard English noun has just three forms. A base form, like father, a plural form, fathers, and a possessive form, also fathers. The odd outlier aside, that's pretty much it. By contrast, Proto-Indo-European has dozens of noun forms. In addition to singular and plural, dual forms existed to show two of something. Multiplying the complexity further was Proto-Indo-European's system of eight cases. PIE words in general can be broken up into three parts. The root, the suffix, and the ending. The root is the core of a word, conveying a fundamental bit of information. Roots were always monosyllabic, and could only contain certain combinations of sounds. An optional suffix could then be applied to add more information or generate a different category of word. The noun cheretrom consists of the root cher, which means the word is to do with ploughing, and the suffix trom, which often indicated an instrument of some sort. So it was an instrument to do with ploughing, in other words, a plough. Noun endings were then applied for case and number. Proto-Indo-European is full of systems where productive suffixes churn out new words. For example, adjectives could become causative verbs through the suffix erye. So the adjective pers, meaning dry, becomes torseye, to make dry, to which verb endings are then added. A distinguishing feature of Indo-European is the ablaut, which refers to the modification of vowels within a word. Take the English verbs swim, swam, and swum. They're all different tenses, but the only thing distinguishing them are the alternative vowels. This system of English is inherited from Proto-Indo-European, and you see it time and time again across all Indo-European languages, and at all stages of the English language. It was very prevalent in PIE, and existed for words of all types. Verbs, like nouns, display a great deal of morphological complexity, a simple glance at a conjugation table will show you that. Dozens of forms accounted for the two-ish tenses, four moods, three aspects, three persons, three numbers and two voices of PIE verbs. Explaining it all will take too long, but a few things merit mention. Firstly, tense and aspect. If you're unclear as to the precise definition of these words, then check out my video explaining the topic in the description. Tense took a back seat whereas aspect was the most important division. PIE verbs had three aspects. Stative, for verbs that indicated a state of being. Imperfective, for ongoing or incomplete actions. And perfective, for complete unitary actions. 
Some verbs had all three aspect stems, like the verb for stand. There was the imperfective stiterti, which means is getting up, the perfective stet, which means stood up, and stetoe, the stative form which means is standing. The two tenses, past and present, had different endings, but only the imperfective could use the present tense and past tense endings. The perfective may do with just the past tense endings, while the stative had its own endings used for both tenses. Also worth mentioning are the Indo-European voices. If you grew up speaking English, you are used to a clean division between the active and passive voice. The active shows that someone is doing something, the passive that someone is having something done to them. The active voice was present in PIE just the same, but there was no clear-cut passive voice. Instead, Proto-Indo-European relies on the medio-passive voice, which conveyed a range of meaning. In some circumstances it could be passive, but it could also convey reflexive actions done unto oneself, or actions done for one's own benefit, or that someone is causing themselves to change in some way. Proto-Indo-European lacks some other features of English. Like Latin, there were no articles. There were also no third-person singular pronouns, that is, he, she, or it. In a pinch, Proto-Indo-European could use demonstrative pronouns, like that, in place of third-person pronouns. In Proto-Indo-European, the demonstrative pronouns were saw, seer, and tod, for the masculine, feminine, and neuter genders, respectively. But that's enough grammar for now. What were the Proto-Indo-Europeans like? Well, by combining linguistics with genetic and archaeological evidence, we can fill in some of the blanks, although many gaps remain. As per our best guess, Proto-Indo-European was probably spoken in the steppe lands north of the Black Sea, and has been linked with the Yamnaya culture, which dated from 3300 to 2600 BC. The other major contender for an Indo-European homeland was Anatolia, but this has fallen out of favour, as advances in genetic history have enabled us to track the spread of peoples out of the steppe. Irrespective of where, the reconstructed lexicon provides us with hints as to how these people lived. To simplify, if we can reconstruct a PIE word for something, then they had access to that thing. This is not foolproof. For example, we cannot reconstruct the PIE word for eyelash, and they probably had some of those. Nevertheless, what lexicon we do have tells us that they had a mixed economy of pastoral and arable agriculture, had access to the wheel, and had a patriarchal society. At the latest, the language lasted until the middle of the 3rd millennium BC. That marks the time to move on. Proto-Indo-European is fragmenting. New daughter languages are taking root across Eurasia, and the next step, pardon the pun, will take us from the open steppe to the frigid waters of the Orisund. Next stop, Proto-Germanic, the ancestor of all the Germanic languages. The gap between Proto-Indo-European and its earliest reconstructable Germanic daughter is massive, simply due to the fact that the Germanic languages themselves are attested rather late compared to Latin or Greek or Sanskrit. As such, Proto-Germanic has been reconstructed with a rough date of 500 BC, at least two millennia after the end of Proto-Indo-European. Much happened during those long years, changes in phonology and grammar that distinguished the Germanic branch. It's best that we start with the sounds and sound changes of Proto-Germanic. Perhaps the most famous sound change in all of linguistics concerns Proto-Germanic. This is Grimm's Law, named after one of the two brothers Grimm. It took place early on in the evolution of Proto-Germanic, and consisted of several stages that overturned the plosive sounds of PIE. The most famous stipulation is that the unvoiced plosives of PIE became unvoiced fricatives articulated in the same place of the mouth. The point about articulation is worth reiterating, because people assume as a rule of thumb that P became F. This was not the case, since F is articulated with the lower lip and upper teeth, whereas P is articulated with both lips. As such, the output was FA, a fricative articulated with both lips. Only later did the articulation change, creating the correspondence we see when comparing Germanic and Romance words for father. 
The two other sections of Grimm's Law also pertain to the PIE plosives. Firstly, voiced plosives became unvoiced. Secondly, aspirated plosives became unaspirated. This allowed for a possible chain of sound changes, as plosives were converted into fricatives. A plethora of other sound changes took place as well, but this is the most famous. Beyond phonology, the verb system of Proto-Germanic was also remodelled. As we saw, the basic division among PIE verbs was one of aspect, and each verb had different stems to reflect this. By contrast, Proto-Germanic no longer distinguished aspect. Instead, the system was remodelled around two tenses, past and present. This streamlined system involved far fewer stems and had fewer inflections, and is one of the distinguishing features of Germanic and of English today. So if you ever wondered why English is Germanic and not Romance, despite 60% of its vocabulary coming from Romance languages, it's down to the fundamentally Germanic nature of its grammar, which includes things like the verbal system. Germanic verbs fall into one of two camps, strong and weak, depending on how they form the past. This remains true of English today. Broadly speaking, weak verbs suffix a dental sound, d or t, to the end of the verb, to mark the past tense. Think of play versus played, or burn versus burnt. Those are weak verbs. Strong verbs mark the past tense with ablaut, a change in the vowel of a word. Think of eat versus ate, or sing versus sang and sung. In English, these paradigms have become greatly simplified in comparison to Proto-Germanic, but the underlying logic was basically the same. Very unusually, the seventh class of strong verbs took the step of reduplicating the initial syllable to make the past tense. Reduplication like this was typical of PIE, and represents an archaism in Germanic. Proto-Germanic shed other parts of the PIE verb system, such as the subjunctive mood, the so-called subjunctive mood of Germanic was in fact derived from the optative mood of PIE, which signalled a wish or desire. The case system of PIE had also been chipped away at. The eight cases had been reduced to six by Proto-Germanic times, and the dual form of nouns was lost. The medio-passive voice also became strictly passive in meaning. A unique feature of Germanic languages is the verb second word order. If you were taught German in school, then this has already been drummed into your head. In main clauses, the underlying word order places the inflected verb in the second position, with adverbs or other clauses pushing the subject to third place after the verb. Modern English has mostly lost this feature in its syntax, although it remains in a few constructions like never have I ever. Proto-Germanic was most likely spoken in southern Scandinavia and the Jutland Peninsula during the Iron Age, from roughly 500 BC to AD 200. The important archaeological cultures of this region were the Jastorf culture of Denmark and Saxony, and the Nordic Iron Age cultures, on the other side of the Orisund. Some speakers of Proto-Germanic dialects moved south, where they enter history as the perennial bugbears of Rome. At the same time, they also began interacting with the neighbouring Celts, and took on a number of Celtic loanwords. Many of these loans relate to social and political relations and to warfare, perhaps indicating that the Celts enjoyed greater societal complexity than the Germans at this time. A loan word worth mentioning in its own right is Walhaz, which meant foreigner or speaker of a foreign language, which usually implied a Celtic or Latin language. It derived from the Celtic name for the Volcae, a Gallic tribe that lived to the south. Walhaz would go on to have a long life, and descendants of it appeared as labels for various people across Europe. When Germanic tribes invaded the British Isles in the 5th century, they encountered various Celtic-speaking peoples and lumped them all together as foreigners. Walchas became Wilsh in Old English, from where we get our word for the Celts living to the west of England, the Welsh. Wallonia, the French-speaking half of Belgium, also takes its name from Walchas, while further east, the term was again deployed to describe the Romanian-speaking people of the Balkans as Vlax. That's one far-flung word. Loan words from other languages were not initially as prominent in Proto-Germanic, but over time the Western dialects gradually absorbed increasing amounts of Latin words as well. During the first centuries AD, Proto-Germanic dialects diversified and diverged, falling into one of three main groups. East Germanic, which split off first, North Germanic, 
the antecedent of Norse, and West Germanic, to which English belongs. As the migration period began, and Germanic tribes struck out in search of lands to settle, groups of Germans living on the coast, speaking a loose subgroup called Ingvaionic, crossed to Britannia. They raided and traded, but as the Roman Empire collapsed, some began to stick around, first serving as soldiers for local dynasts, and then taking over for themselves. Chief among the immigrants were the Saxons and Jutes, as well as the Angles from Schleswig-Holstein. In time, this latter group gave its name to the rest of the Germanic folk in Britain. They and their fellow tribes came to call their new home Englaland, and the joint language they spoke, Englisch. Old English is the first stage for which we have lots of textual evidence, in the form of Bibles, stories like Beowulf, and historical accounts like the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. It was, for the first time, a distinctly English language, but remains mostly impenetrable to modern speakers. Unlike its present-day iteration, most of the vocabulary was still Germanic in origin. Nouns still retained case and gender, much like German, and it resembled more closely the continental Germanic languages of today. Case-wise, Old English had five. The grammatical complexity gave Old English the benefit of a freer word order. Although it probably possessed an underlying verb second order, it was flexible. These five cases then intersected with three grammatical genders, resulting in many inflectional possibilities, as demonstrated here through the various forms of the definite article. Which brings us to another point, the emergence of the definite article. Proto-Indo-European did not have a definite or indefinite article, words like the or an, nor did its daughter, Proto-Germanic. They did, however, have demonstrative articles, meaning this or that, and it was from these words that the definite article emerged. In Old English, the demonstrative now served both purposes. Sebat could mean either the boat or that boat, and as such, it was used sparingly as a definite article. The two only firmly diverged as independent words at a later state in the language, when the inflection paradigm began to fall apart. Meanwhile, the Old English word arn, meaning one, was adapted into the indefinite article, eventually becoming an and its alternate form a. Other things you might have noted from the table are the various letters now lost to the English alphabet. There was f and thorn, both of which represented th sounds, while win represented w, since that letter had not yet been invented. Thorn and win were borrowed from the old runic script of Proto-Germanic, which survived more fully in Scandinavia, where it was used to write Old Norse, but only fragmentarily from earlier times. The runes themselves had been adapted from an Italic alphabet, possibly Latin, during the 1st and 2nd centuries AD, and remained in use to write Old English until the 8th century, which explains these remnants. Britain in the early Middle Ages was a melting pot of different cultures. The Anglo-Saxon conquests rumbled inexorably on until most of England was under their sway, causing the prior Romano-British folk to acculturate to the new Germanic ways. The remaining Celtic populations were constrained to the west, while the advent of a new menace was heralded by the appearance of dragon ships in the east. Warlike and opportunistic raiders began rocking up in ever greater numbers, seeking gold and glory. The Vikings. They hailed from Scandinavia and spoke Old Norse, a cousin of Old English. By the 9th century, Norse settlements had sprouted up across northern England, although scholars debate their extent and magnitude. The Norsemen played a major part in the history of England, while their language would play an even bigger one for the history of English. In contrast to the Celtic tongues, which had little influence on the development of English, Old Norse may have changed the very nature of the language. Some postulate that contact with Norse catalyzed a wholesale change of English, going from a highly inflected language along the lines of Latin to its simpler modern form. Much grammatical complexity has been lost since the Old English period, so perhaps Norse was the culprit. Well, maybe, but there is a range of views on the topic, and some believe that this was due to internal developments rather than foreign influences. With that caveat aside, 
The Norse contact theory is worth explaining in greater detail, because it's quite intriguing. As cousins of the Germanic family, they shared many inheritances, and a striking amount of innovations too, leading some to wonder what degree of mutual intelligibility existed between the two. The theory posits that there was a significant degree of overlap, with verbs and nouns being very similar aside from the endings. So over time, the endings were eroded to facilitate communication. The loss of certain inflectional patterns seems to radiate out from the north, where Norse settlement was the heaviest. Oddly, Norse vocabulary in modern English is fairly limited, numbering just a few hundred words. A lot of these are fairly important, such as the pronoun they. But still, a few hundred words is nothing compared to the tens of thousands of French and Latin words imported after the Norman conquest. This may have been due to the similarity of both languages, meaning that large-scale imports of Norse vocabulary were not necessary. The final major ruction of early English history came in 1066, when the Normans invaded, slaying the final Anglo-Saxon king and subduing England. A new and radically different period in English history had begun. Traditionally, this date is taken as the beginning of Middle English, but the transition has also been dated to the later 12th century, and as with all linguistic changes, it was a gradual process. During this period, the language changed to be far more like its modern form, and once you were acclimatised to the odd spelling, a modern speaker might just be able to understand a text. The Norman conquest made French the language of government and courtly life in England, displacing English from the upper echelons of society. Many English words of French origin thus relate to governance and law and other high-class pursuits. Some food words display a dichotomy between low-status Germanic and high-status French. For example, we still call cows by their Germanic name because the Anglo-Saxon peasants would have farmed them, but we usually order beef, a French-derived word, at a restaurant because the meats were more often served at high-class tables. It wasn't all upper-class stuff, though. 30% of English words derive from French, with another 30% coming from Latin, often through French as well. Despite this vast influence, the core English lexicon remains mostly Germanic. Because Wessex had been the dominant Anglo-Saxon kingdom, an old English literary standard had emerged around the West Saxon dialect. But the displacement of English from government led to a breakdown of this literary uniformity. There was no longer a prestigious centre that English writers could emulate, and fewer scribes learnt English anyway, so knowledge of the old standard was lost. Numerous literary forms cropped up, reflecting the many dialectical variations that define British English. In the late 14th century, a new London standard began to develop, and beginning in the early 15th century with Henry V, kings began to promote the use of English in government again. Henry's reign saw an intensification of the Hundred Years' War against France, and he sought to encourage a separate English identity in his aristocracy, and so English gradually returned to the upper classes during the 1400s. While the prestige of the language grew, its inflectional patterns had been simplified and levelled out. Grammatical gender died out, while the case system shriveled up and became less useful. The forms of the definite article had been merged into just one, there, while weak nouns had just two endings, e and en, meaning that it couldn't really convey much grammatical information anymore. Instead, grammatical information was shown differently, resulting in the very rigid word order of modern English. In the sentences, I gave the dog the cat, and I gave the cat the dog, we know which animal is being given to what, because indirect objects come first, and direct objects second. Changing the word order fundamentally alters the meaning, so it has to stay rigid. Whereas in the Old English translations of those sentences it wouldn't really make a difference because the indirect and direct objects are already shown through case, the dative and accusative respectively. The Middle English period is said to end around the year 1500, but before it was out, one final momentous change got underway, the Great Vowel Shift. This began around 1400 and carried on until the 1700s, resulting in a complete overhaul of the vowel system. To see its results, we arrive at the final stop on our journey, Modern English. The timing of the Great Vowel Shift was unfortunate because English spelling became increasingly standardised during the 1500s, 
so these spellings quickly became obsolete as the spoken language ran away from them. This is partially why English has such brainless spelling today. The shift mostly affected long vowels, and the general trajectory with its modern results can be summarised as this. A quirky innovation of modern English is the widespread use of do as an auxiliary verb. This is called the do support. Contrary to popular belief, do supports are not unique to English, but their prevalence in the language certainly is. Various forms of colloquial German make occasional use of do supports, but standard German avoids it. In English today, do support is used to make most questions and negative imperatives, and it is ungrammatical to do otherwise. This contrasts with the standard forms of the other Germanic languages, which form questions through word order inversion. Some have suggested that do supports originated from Welsh, which also uses do for questions, but this theory is controversial, especially since do supports are a late development in English, and the Celtic languages were marginal by that point, so it's doubtful whether they could have influenced English. It is more likely that do supports arose from within English itself, a theory evidenced by the colloquial appearance of do supports in other Germanic languages. The singular second person pronoun thou was replaced by you. Back in Middle English, the ancestor of you was first used singly to address someone of higher rank due to the influence of French, which had the separate second person pronouns tu and vous to express degrees of formality and respect. However, thou remained in use for informal situations until the 1700s, when it came to be perceived as less polite, and potentially even insulting. So to avoid the confusion that came along with thou, it fell out of fashion, and was replaced by you. But the evolutions of the language itself were small fry when set against the historical background, and the global transformation that English would undergo. During the modern period, English arose from a fairly unimportant Western European language to the global lingua franca, spoken by people everywhere. Closer to home in the British Isles, a negative image of English dominance is produced by tracking the parallel decline of its Celtic neighbours. In Ireland, centuries of English domination and periodic brutalisation, as well as a programme of colonisation by Protestant English speakers, caused the native language to wither away to the west coast. Only 39.8% of Irish people can speak the language, while Welsh and Scottish Gaelic suffered similar attrition, and are today understood by 17.8% and 1.1% of the Welsh and Scottish populations respectively. An interesting and oft forgotten relative of English is the Scots language, spoken by 30.1% of Scots. It emerged from the Northumbrian dialects of Old English, and dominated the Scottish lowlands. But during the 15th century, and especially after the personal union of England and Scotland in 1603, English began to influence and displace Scots. The languages were, and still are, relatively similar, so absorbing English influence was a fairly simple process, especially as the authorities began to discourage the use of Scots in favour of English. Thus the linguistic map of the British Isles continued to tilt in favour of English, but the most important upheavals were taking place thousands of miles away, in countries and lands that few Britons had ever heard of until now. The early modern period was marked by the rise of colonialism as a global force, and although England, later Britain, was not first to the table, it eventually established outposts of its own. Gradually, and then with increasing speed, English spread to every continent. In America and Australia, where the decimation of native populations was most total, English replaced the former languages almost entirely while in Africa and Asia it coexisted alongside the myriad native languages. Today, India, Nigeria and Pakistan, all former British colonies, are ranked second, third and fourth by total English-speaking populations. First place is also held by an ex-colony, the United States of America. The impact of two successive world superpowers, the British Empire and then the US, both speaking English, was massive. With so much of the world economy under the control of English-speaking empires, learning the language was a logical step for millions of people, never ruled directly by Britain or the US, enabling it to spread far and wide. For example, English remains the most widely understood language in the European Union, even after the United Kingdom left, with 44% of EU citizens understanding it. 
Globally, 1.5 billion people speak English, of which only 380 million have it as their mother tongue. Its global reach has now become self-reinforcing, as ever more people learn it. Currently, an additional 1.5 billion people are studying it. Nowadays, the popularity of English-speaking media, whether that be music, television or film, plays a key role in reinforcing the language's dominant position. A quick Wikipedia search will tell you that of the 50 best-selling music artists of all time, only two came from non-English-speaking countries. Meanwhile, the US and Canada control 34.5% of the global movie and entertainment market. Hollywood alone pumps out literally hundreds of films a year. Much of this media will end up going into translation, of course, but not all, allowing non-English speakers to become acclimatised to and perhaps take on some of the language. So English is on course to grow for the foreseeable future. But where will it go next as a language? What will it look like in hundreds of years? Well, this video is meant to be a history, so I won't delve into the realm of speculation today. But if the past one and a half thousand years is anything to go by, then the language spoken by your distant descendants could be a far cry from what you're listening to right now.